Father, we just thank you for today. And thank you for the opportunity that we have again to look at another book. A book that's so very different and yet its, its message is profound and will set, touch some people very specifically. And so guide us, help us as we go through it now. We just give you this time in your name, amen. amen. Now as we look at the guideline where we ended last class, as we had gotten this far, we look at the story of the narrative in Exodus of Moses leading up to the Exodus and what happened after that, where he was saved, the king was out to kill his life, God meets with him, he goes back. We see the magicians now, we see Pharaoh's magicians talking to him, we see the Persian magicians that talk to him. Then we see now that Moses is going to lead the people through the Red Sea. And what we're going to see now is that as we get out of chapter 2, which is the Magi, it's going to take us right into the story of Jesus' baptism. He's going to go from chapter 2, the Magi, to chapter 3, his water baptism, and he's going to go through his water ritual, his water rite. Immediately after they cross the Red Sea, Israel starts their wilderness journey. And in that wilderness journey, they're going to face several things, including many temptations. And in Matthew chapter 4, now Jesus goes into the wilderness immediately after that, and his temptation follows. And Israel's in the wilderness 40 years. Jesus is there 40 days. And so they go through this cycle, uh, tempting and testing and everything else to see what's in their heart. We see down towards the end, down here, that what is going to happen in the Exodus story is that Moses is going to bring him to a mountain, chapter 19. The reason for that mountain is so that the people can enter into a covenant. And right after chapter 4, we get into Matthew chapter 5, Jesus brings his people to a mountain. And he stands on the mountain and he begins to preach. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And we see the words that come out of Moses' mouth as he comes down off the mountain, as he has the law of God, and he says, Thou shalt not, but the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, Blessed. Notice the distinction, because once again, the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Jesus came to bring in a system that was far better than Moses. And so for the faithful Jewish people that were still looking to Moses and the law and the fulfillment of all of that, Jesus came not to abolish it, but to fulfill it and to bring something far better. And so when Matthew constructs the opening stories of Jesus, he includes in it elements some of which none of the other writers do because it's part of the package that he's presenting. He wants to see that the kingdom is being established, that the people are being delivered, that now this great leader is coming in and setting everything in place for his people to move towards their destiny. And so he specifically, remember I gave you two words, selectivity and adaptive. <clears throat> He's going to select the material he wants. He's going to adapt it to what he's trying to say, and he presents it now. And I guarantee you this, when the Jewish people read this book and they go back and see Herod trying to kill the babies and everything, I guarantee there's stuff in the past from Exodus that's immediately going to come to their mind. That is their history. And say, so we can read that, and I know people for years have read through Matthew and never see that the Herod's death, you know, putting the children of Bethlehem, had anything to even to do with the story of Moses. Why? Because they don't have the heritage of that in their minds and their hearts. But Matthew puts it in because his readers did. And so this is just an example of how the guys in the Bible can arrange the stories and put their twist on them so that you learn the lessons through the history, the lessons that the author now wants you to come to. It's not just random. It's very, very specific and very purposeful. So here you go. Have fun with it. And you can go back home and preach it and impress everybody, and they'll think that you're good. All right. Here you go. Okay. Now, today as we get into our next book, go into the Gospel of Mark, we're going to be looking at a, a book whose, whose style and the structure of it is so very, very different. Mark is the oldest of the four Gospels. It's believed by the majority of them, uh, the scholars today, that it was the first of the four Gospels that was uh, written. And in fact, it's going to be the primal source from which at least Matthew and Luke are going to draw some of their material. Uh, Mark is going to draw from a lot of the oral traditions and the things that Jesus has said and done and put them together in a very unique format. Now this first little book is like 
the first exposure for a lot of people to Jesus. This is the first book, written book, that they would ever have any chance to hear to telling them about this one that they've only heard about at a distance. And so this is going to be their first encounter. And the first encounter is very interesting because Luke, or Mark rather, has some distinct features to it. Number one is this. It is not now a highly linguistically structured book. The literary devices in this book are very, very few. You don't find some of the elaborate messages. You don't find a lot of the, some of the elaborate figurative use of language and so forth. It's just a real straightforward little book. It is basically what some will refer to when they go down and they address it. They say this, it is a book now that is designed to basically give people just a stark representation. It's a simple, popular approach to the history of an individual. It's a simple and a popular approach. It's like people talking on the street corner, just pulling up story after story, but not arranging them in any great context or putting them in any great literary devices. It's just stories all thrown together. This is probably the most unchronological of the four Gospels. And what we mean by that is that Mark, once he gets past the story of Jesus and his temptation, his baptism and everything else, the stories, the healings and everything else are all lumped together. There's no passage of time. It doesn't say Jesus went from one place to another. You'll find in some chapters, he'll heal somebody, he'll heal somebody else, and about seven other times, and then it just goes on. But there's no frame of reference. It doesn't tell you they all happen in the same place. It's just Mark says, he heals, he heals, he heals, and it may cover a whole bunch of time. And then later he's going to say, he promised, he promised, he promised, and just sticks a bunch of stuff together. This is the way he puts this book together. And so we look at it, we realize that the message it gives to us is not going to help us a whole lot with the history of Jesus, but it's going to help us a whole lot now with his life and his actions and give us a window into his life. And so Mark is our starting point. Where do we start? Let me just tell you his story. Later, it'll get into his teachings, his theology. It'll get into the eschatological ramifications. But right now, let me just show you Jesus. Let me show you what he does on his days off. He heals people. He opens eyes of the blind, and he does this. And this is people's first exposure. And that's why the Gospel of Mark is a great one to give to people to start if they're brand new Christian. Let them read this book. Why? Because they don't have to work through some of the heavy statements that you find in some of the sermons in the other chapters. They just see somebody who really loves people. He's going out, he's helping people, and for their young heart at this point, said, that's what I need. I don't need, in the beginning was the Logos and the Logos. No, I don't know, I don't need that. You know, I wanna know is, I'm hurting, can Jesus help, okay? And so that's the Jesus you give them. That's where you start their journey. And then you can take them to some of the other Gospels and that will help build on their faith as they grow up. I'd like you to turn to the last chapter of Mark. And this creates the textual challenge that we have. Some people are really impacted whenever they run into a textual challenge because it begins to erode their confidence in the Bible. But remember, your Bible that you have is a collection, it's a composite of scholars looking at numerous different manuscripts down through the years. I mentioned to you back in the beginning that there are over 5,500 different Greek manuscripts that scholars look at. Some of them are complete, some of them are partial. One book, some of them are just very, very small. They're just a portion of one verse. But we view all of this trying to get an idea of what were the most common expressions in the book. In Mark chapter 16, and you go down into verse eight, You'll notice as you read through it, and it says, And they went out, and they fled from the tomb now, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to one another, for they were afraid. And if you notice the next verse, some of you will have a break in your Bible between verses 8 and 9. Uh, some of you in your Bible at the beginning of verse 9 will have a bracket there. And so that verses 9 down through the end of the chapter, verse 20, are bracketed. And you'll have a marginal note in there that says this. The oldest manuscripts do not include this section. Some will say the best manuscripts do not include this section. And so it's been 
offered now by some scholars that the long ending, verses 9 through 20 of Mark, should not be there. Now, this is the challenge that we run into. And what they mean by the oldest manuscripts is this. I mentioned to you two manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. They are the two oldest complete manuscripts of the New Testament that we have, uh, both written about 325, 330 AD. And that's as close back as we can get with the totality. They're considered to be two of the finest manuscripts available. Both of them do not include verses 9 through 20. Interesting, though, in the Sinaiticus, in the version that was discovered, after the end of verse 8, though, instead of immediately starting the next book, which was the, the manner of the manuscripts, or to go to the next column and starting it there, there's about a column and a half of empty room in the manuscript, and then it starts the Gospel of Luke, implying very strongly that that column and a half, which would have been exactly the room for the long ending, was something that the person who wrote the, the Sinaitic has said, this is an option that we should at least consider. In the different manuscripts that are out there, you will find that some of the early church fathers in the first three centuries did not include it. What you will find, though, is that many of them did. And in fact, there are more manuscripts back there that will include it than exclude it. And so it creates a challenge for us, and that is this. Should the last portion of the book of Mark, the long ending, be included? Some of the arguments for it is this. If we don't include the long ending, then I'll tell you where Mark ends. The disciples running away afraid. That's how it ends. Because in the end of verse 8, they were terrified they were running away afraid. If you read the long ending, though, it sees them going on and Jesus encountering them and promising them this. The same power that was in me is the same power that shall be the signs of all who believe. And begins to show them that the Holy Spirit that empowered him would empower them, and this would be the characteristic trait of their life. Also notice this, that the signs of the believer that you find down there in verses 15 down through verse 18 says, go into the world and preach now. And so the purpose for the signs is to supplement and go side by side with the preaching of the gospel. These signs are to prove that the spoken message now is backed up by the authority and the power of God. And so when you look at the signs that are there, it says, but he that preaches now and so forth, and these are the signs, they talk about it in the name, you cast out demons, you're going to speak in new tongues, you're going to pick up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing, it's not, and they're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. What you're going to find is this, every one of those signs, except for one, is repeated in other places in the New Testament, now as being legitimate signs of those who believe. You're going to find speaking in tongues. You're going to find casting out demons. It's going to be there. You're going to find Paul in the book of Acts when he's bitten on the Isle of Malta with a serpent and he shakes off the serpent in the fire. The bite of the serpent can't affect him. You're going to find healing as being one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and so forth. The only one that you will not find referred to in later lists is if they drink a deadly thing, somebody is poisoned and it won't have any effect upon them. So what we find is this. There is nothing in that list really that is not going to be supported later on. There is nothing in that list except for that one that are not by other authors, including Luke in the next uh, gospel, Luke chapter 10, when he mentions two of them as being signs of the disciples that go out under the power of the Lord. So it's not that it's submitted there. Now, the reason why a lot of people fight the long ending, and I'll be very honest with you, is this, is if the signs that follow believers mentioned in verses down there, uh, uh, 17 and 18, are not evident in the lives of believers, then do we question that they are believers? So those who don't believe in the, the charismatic manifestation of healing, and speaking in tongues, and casting out demons, don't believe that they're for today, don't believe that they were to be passed on past the first century in the lives of believers, would now support the short ending because they don't have to deal with the problematic text. Because if they state to be a believer, but these things aren't evidenced in their life, then this passage is now questionable to them. But for those people who believe on the basis of other passages, 1 Corinthians 12, the book of Acts, and so forth, that signs do follow the believers, then this passage offers nothing in contradiction to that. So, say this, 
and that's the end of our little discussion, there is ample evidence in the early church documentation, in later proof texts that you find in other places in the Bible, to not question the authenticity of it. You'll find many of the early church fathers writing in the second century, which was even before the Sinaiticus, when they wrote their commentaries on Mark, included the long ending because they saw it as a legitimate part of the gospel. So some translations will separate it there and said, doing that, and in seeing that bracket, it caused some people to question now the value of this, the legitimacy of it, but there is good ground to say it is appropriate, it is adequate, and it's in my Bible. This little book here, as we go through it, the title of our book is The Book of the Servant. It's The Book of the Servant. Now you remember in the chart that I showed you two classes ago in our overview of the gospel, in each of the four gospels, Jesus is presented in a different capacity. Matthew presents him as the king of the Jews, but Mark is going to present him as a servant. And you see this in his actions. No magi visiting, no angels at his birth. In fact, his birth is not even mentioned. It starts in, right off the bat with the ministry of John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. Why? Because in the thinking of Mark, let's not deal with all the preliminaries, let's just get into it. And he jumps right into Jesus' public ministry. He says, that other stuff's okay, and other guys are writing about that, but that's not what I'm writing about. And so he dives right into it, and we begin to see his life. And as you go through these opening verses here in the, in the book, and we'll see some examples of it, we run into this theme called servant. Now, in our thinking today, because especially you who come from the United States, our concept of servant is associated with our concept of slavery, which then is associated with a very derogatory and a racial concept and idea. But realize when you're dealing with the area of a servant in the Bible, it's not racial because people had servants from their own people group and so forth. It has to do with a position of loyalty to another and a position that often carried with it great honor and great responsibility. When a man owned a large field and so forth, he would send out a servant because he himself couldn't go monitor everything that was done. So he would have to be in the city doing business with the elders of the city and so forth. So what would he do? He would send a servant out to represent him. And the authority of the master was resident on the servant. So as he would go into the field and talk to the workers and everything else, when he spoke, he spoke as the master. Why? Because the authority of the master is in a faithful servant. And this is why when you go through the New Testament, you'll find how many times in the epistles, almost every one of Paul's epistles, John does it, Peter does it, James does it, and so forth, when they open their books, they say, I, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ. And he will say that before he will call himself an apostle. Now, in our thinking today, many times, because we get so hung up on offices and titles, we would put that first to make sure everybody knows how important we are. But what Paul wanted his readers to know is this. It doesn't matter what office or what capacity I have later, what title is on my door. The issue is this. I'm a servant. God has appointed me. He has called me to be his servant. Because what? I'm following the role model of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this planet not to be served, but to serve. Amen. He who was rich made himself poor that others could be rich. He poured his life out for other people. Yes, he's God. Yes, he will be worshiped. But while he was here, he touched the lives of people. And if that's the path that my Savior walks, then that's the path that I should walk to. And so the theme of a servant comes in, and please don't reduce that and say, well, that's just a little thing. Oh, no. If you go back into the Old Testament, especially the writings of Isaiah, and once you get from chapter 40 on, and there's a huge break, if you remember from survey, between 39 and 40 in Isaiah, there's a break. Because the first 39 chapters are judgment because of violations of the law. But starting in chapter 4 is the message, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, a voice crying in the wilderness, which begins the New Testament era. And right after chapter 40, one of the key messages that keeps being brought up in Isaiah is my servant. My servant. My servant. 
and he sends him. Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 49, Isaiah chapter 53, my servant who was smitten, my servant who bore his back and took lashes, my servant, and Isaiah refers to Jesus as the suffering servant, the servant who is faithful unto death. And as he says, it pleased him by his will to smite him because his greatest act of service, and Mark picks this up in Mark chapter 10, verses 43 to 45. Mark chapter 10, it says, And he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. His greatest act of service was to lay down his life to the will of his Father in heaven. He said, I don't want to do this, but what I want is not the issue. What do you want? It's your will. And so Mark wants to present this kind so that what? People realize they can trust him. He, is, he, he cares for them and so forth. In Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, and you'll see this discussion take place in several places, at least two places in the book. In Mark chapter 9, as his disciples are walking along one day, and they're, they're typical Bible college students. They, they ramble about theological issues that really don't matter. And, you know, and they, they just get in there, and then they start talking about their giftings and everything else. And they're walking along one day, and, and Jesus says to them, um, verse 33 of, of chapter 9, says they came to Capernaum and when they, uh, he was in the house, he began to question them and says, what were you guys talking about? Well, he knows what they were talking about because earlier on the road they were trying to figure out which of them was the greatest. He says, what were you guys talking about? And it goes on and it says they kept silent. That's a good Bible college student. Won't answer the question. He said, no, no. And it says this, for on the way they've been talking about which of them they thought was the greatest. And Jesus says this, if anyone wants to be first, then he must be servant of all. He's going to say the same thing in the next chapter as he goes down to there. He says, if you want to be great, and if you guys are concerned about greatness, then pour your life out for people, and that will make you great. See, there are people in life that will impress you by their magnanimous deeds. There are other people who will touch your life and will change you. And they may not be in the newspaper, the front page of the sports section, but one thing is very important. They came and touched your life at a time when you needed that touch, and that touch changed you forever. <coughs> what we need is people who are faithful to do that. No limelight, no magazines, no books, no nothing. Just faithful people that go and they watch the hand of their master in heaven when he points to somebody and says, go talk to that person, they need a hug. They really need encouragement right now. Do that. The servant does that. Why? <laughs> because he's focused on the will of his master that is up there. And so we see Jesus now presented in this way. And then in chapter 13, he's going to go and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to give my authority to you because I give my authority to my servants. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It's seemingly a paradox, but yet it's very important. The key word that you're going to see through this book, it's used about 41 times through this short little book, it characterizes a servant, is the word immediate. It's the word immediate. Nine different times, some say ten, in chapter one, and go through your translations, and it says this, immediately Jesus went to this place. <laughs> immediately he talked to this person. And by the time you get through chapter 1, it's obvious that that word immediate is used now in excess to make a point. <clears throat> what they want you to see is this. Jesus was quick to respond to the leading of his Father. He was very quick to respond. Now, let me throw out to you a, a little subtle hint of life because these are the life principles that we have. When Joanne and I first got married and we started having our kids and bringing them up and we were faced with the same challenges that all parents are, and that is raising children. And the goal of that is not to survive, okay? <laughs> the goal of that is to produce healthy adults that can function on their own, that can have respectable character, that can have good moral virtues in their life and so forth. And so all that training process, your goal is so that they become good adults. And one of the most important lessons that you teach your children is obedience. 
It starts from the minute they learn the word no. Okay? And that's usually the first word that most children learn in their vocabulary. No. And they say it with <laughs> attitude. Okay? It comes across. Parents have to deal with this. Now, how do you teach a child to obey? Well, one of the aspects of that must be that you teach them to obey quickly. There's a little phrase that we used, and we used it when we helped other parents when they were younger, and that is this. Teach your children first-time obedience. Which is what? The first time mommy and daddy say something, you do it then. Because you go to a supermarket and you see the mom in the supermarket and what's she doing? Don't do that. I told you. One, two, what are you doing? You're teaching the kid not to obey. You're teaching the kid to delay obedience. You're not helping the child at all. What you do is say, do it, and when they don't, you deal with it so that next time when you talk to them, they respond quickly. The book of Psalms says this, a wise servant watches the hand of his master. So I have watched you, O Lord. And it's describing now a servant in the court of a king in the ancient world. And the servants in a banquet would stand to the side of the room as the master of the feast would be sitting at the head table and all the guests. And a well-trained servant would stand over there and the whole time his eyes would be on his master and on his hand. And if the master looked at the table and there was something missing, all he had to do was look and have said, we need more wine or more food, and he would simply point to it, and the servant was gone. He was out to get it. The master didn't even have to talk to him. Why? Because the heart of the servant was so focused on the will of the master that it only took a slight gesture. Can God tug at our heart and we respond, or does he have to yell? Does he have to come time and time? Read the book of, of Amos. I sent a drought. I sent a famine. I sent locusts. I sent all these different things. One, two, three, four. And you still don't listen to me. Prepare to meet your God, which means we're going to the bedroom. Okay? You're going to get thrashed. Okay? That's what this means. It boils down to it. God wants to teach us to be his servants. And Jesus is going to show us how to do that. Because in this book, we're going to see that a servant is faithful in easy times and in times that aren't easy. Now, the author of the book. Now, Mark is a very colorful little guy. And immediately, his authorship of this book raises a challenge because Mark was not one of the 12. And if you remember, maybe some of your classes, Canon Basic Doctrine, told you that when the New Testament books were canonized, and they were finally decided on which ones would be included, the number one criterion for a book being submitted into the Bible was that it was authored by an apostle or by somebody under the influence of an apostle. Mark was not. He was not one of the twelve. We don't find him in a list necessarily of any of the apostles that came later, like Barnabas and Paul and so forth. So how does he get away with writing a book? Well, it could be because of the influence of an apostle upon his life. And maybe he's writing for somebody else. Because if you remember, in the ends of some of Paul's letters, you realize Paul did not write all of his letters. He dictated them to a scribe. Once in a while, he'll say, with my own hand, I wrote this one. But other times, he'll say, Tercetus, he wrote this, and he sends a letter, and so forth. And realize that there were people at times that wrote down the words of a leading apostle. And just as Luke wrote the words of Paul down through the book of Acts, maybe Mark's going to write some down. Now, this little guy has several names. We know him by several names. Um, the book here itself actually didn't bear his name until the second century. The Gospel of Mark was anonymous until the second century AD. It was added there by the church fathers because they knew who wrote it, and they just added it so people would not forget that now that the, the original fathers are gone. But John has a name, a full name. His name is John Mark. Now, Mark is his Roman name. It comes from the Latin name Marcus. And we know him by that. But he also has a surname, which is his other name. And it's his Hebrew name, Johannan, which is John. And so at times in the Bible, you will find that when it's talking about this man, it will call him John, because that is his Hebrew surname. At other times, it will call him Mark. And every once in a while, when he's really bad, his parents will call him John Mark, 
and then you know you're bad whenever your middle name gets used, okay? And so this is what happens. So he's going to come in. Now, he's got an interesting history in there. A couple of little facts about this guy that you know. His mother is recorded in Scripture. Her name is, now is recorded. Her name is Mary, Miriam. And her name is recorded in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12. Now, what makes Miriam very, very significant is this. She had a home in Jerusalem that was a center for Christians praying. Now, if you remember, uh, when Peter is in prison and there, and the angel comes and releases him from prison, he goes. After he's released from prison, where does he go? He goes to Mary's house where saints are praying for him. This is a well-established Christian center in Jerusalem where saints get together. And this is John Mark's mom that's there. And so people know her. The legends are from the early church fathers that when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, it was in this home. Because he found a private home in Jerusalem to celebrate with his disciples. And if that's the case, John Mark may have been able to be one of the little servants to serve Jesus and the Twelve at the table the night before because it may have been in mom's home. So mom is there. What you also know about him is another fact, and that is he has a cousin, a well-known cousin by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas, who is Paul's traveling companion, now is John Mark's cousin. We read this in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. And this is going to tell you what's going to happen later as I recount, because Barnabas and Mark are going to be connected in a very close relationship and a very encouraging one later on. He's also going to be very close to Peter. Very close to Peter. And this is the one that I'd like you to focus on. Because when Peter writes his first epistle, he refers in 1 Peter to Mark as his son. Not necessarily his biological son, but his son, just as Paul, when he calls Timothy, writes to him and said, my son. And he refers to both Timothy and Titus as a son in the faith. The belief is that probably now Peter led John Mark and maybe his mother to a salvation experience. And so that Mark is going to be to Peter what Timothy was to Paul later on. He's going to end up being a successor. He's going to end up doing some of his work for him. And, and that's the picture you get of this little guy. We know this, that in the end of his life, that Mark is going to be in Rome with Peter. He's going to follow through and be with him at that very crucial time, just shortly before Peter's going to be executed. Mark is with him. Now, this little man has a history. We read about it in the book of Acts. There's one story that comes out, and it's a very crucial story. He travels with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. You read about this in Acts 13. So they leave Antioch and they sail to the Isle of Cyprus and they go there. And so Paul and Barnabas are traveling and John Mark goes with them. And he's walking along behind them and he's watching as the gospel begins to go into brand new areas. And he's beginning to get excited about that. But when they left the Isle of Cyprus and they go up to the area of Perga and Pamphylia up on the coast up there, John Mark, and Acts says this, he no longer traveled with them. He went back because he got afraid of the territory that they were going into. They were on the verge of going into Galatia, and the people of Galatia were very temperamental, very hostile, and John Mark says, I'm not going any further. And so he abandons them, and he goes back. Now later, when Paul and Barnabas decide to take the second missionary journey, Barnabas says this, let's take John Mark. And the book of Acts records that Paul says, nothing doing. I don't want him. He's a quitter. This man, when things get hard, he abandons us. I need people who are going to stay. And it says a great argument arose between Paul and Barnabas to the point that Barnabas never traveled with Paul from that day on. His traveling companion from that point on was Silas. And so in his second journey, when he goes to Philippi, where's Barnabas? He's back taking care of his cousin, Mark. Now remember this story, very encouraging story, because the young man did fail. The young man got afraid. He was timid and so he cowered. But you know what he really needed? He needed a Barnabas, which means brother of encouragement. He needed an encouraging person to come into his life after his failure and pick him back up. And what the Bible tells us then is, 
is that he goes on and in the end of his life, as Paul is just waiting his final execution, he writes the book of 2 Timothy, he writes to his son in the faith, and he says, come to me quickly and bring John Mark because he's valuable to me. The boy grew up. The boy grew up, but he didn't grow up because he was rejected. He grew up because somebody encouraged his life through a time of failure. Now later in history, and it's not in the Bible, it records that John Mark now went down to North Africa and he is responsible for the revival of Christianity in North Africa. They tortured him, they drug him through the cities of the streets, and guess what? The scared young boy became a powerful man leading a revival in the continent of Africa. It's uh, believed by some scholars in the 14th chapter of Mark when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a story. It's in Mark, it's in none of the other Gospels. It's just weird. It says, and they arrest Jesus and they're hauling him off and the temple guards are grabbing. And it says there's a young man there in the dark with a bed sheet wrapped around him. And one of the guards grabs the bed sheet and the young man runs off naked in the night. What does that have to do with the prices of apples anywhere? Nothing. Why does it record this young man unless that's Mark in his own gospel saying, that's me. You catch me in the middle of the night, I get scared and I run. But give me a chance to grow up. Now, is it in God's wisdom then that he becomes a friend of Peter? Because what happened to Peter in his great hour? He denied his Lord in fear. He got afraid of an 11-year-old girl. And this man that failed is going to become the man who is going to mentor another young failure and say, let me show you what my Lord did with me. When after the resurrection, he came back and said to the women, and go tell the disciples and tell Peter. And he singles him out because Peter needs some healing at that point. And so did John Mark. And John Mark comes on this point and says, this is what happened to me. This is my story. And let me tell you about a man who was a failure but was made a hero. So we go through and we begin to see how this plays out in his life to the point that we can look at John Mark not as a fearful young man, but as a very strong leader. Now, the date for the book is about 62 to 68. It's about 62 to 68 AD. This puts it there early. It puts it just before the destruction of Jerusalem. It's at a time much like we looked at it in uh, Matthew where a lot is going on. You're right in the middle of the Jewish wars at this point. Nero was persecuting Christians. And if you look at the date there, 62 to 68, and if you go back to the introductory material that I gave you when we dealt with the emperors, the emperor at this time is Nero. The emperor is already killing Christians. And if Mark wrote this book in Rome and he was there with Peter, then he's right in the middle of all that persecution. And maybe that persecution is the motivation that caused him to write this book. Maybe that's stirring his heart and he realized these people to know that there's a powerful Jesus that's bigger than Nero. So he begins to write, begins to talk about it. But the reason it places it there at this time is because in Mark 13, he describes the future destruction of Jerusalem, which means that when Mark wrote his book, Jerusalem hadn't been destroyed yet. But he was prophesying it as a, a very definite event that's coming up. So it was written for the Romans, probably. There's some features in this book uh, that you'll find that you won't find in other books, other Gospels. Uh, you will find Latin words in here. There's probably about a dozen different Latin terms that are used in the text itself. They're called Latinisms. And those words are important to people who speak Latin, which are the Romans, the Italians. When he goes through and he talks about some of the, the Jewish customs, he has to explain them. Why? Because his audience wasn't familiar with them. And so by putting all the pieces together, that's what led us to say that this was written now probably to the Romans in the city of Rome, the church at Rome at that point, as they're going through a difficult time, and it's leading up to some very dark hours for them.
Okay. Special circumstance is what we call the conflict, the persecution, the conflict. Now, when you read commentaries on Mark, what they're going to tell you is that there is a literary device in here. It's one of the few that Mark uses, but there is a literary device, and it's called a conflict motif. It's a conflict motif, and what that means is that the stories are going to show Jesus walking into a situation where he wants to heal somebody, but in healing them, he agitates all of his enemies. He'll walk into a house, and he's going to help somebody, but the minute he helps them, all the guys standing around start looking for opportunities to kill him. And so by the repeated nature, especially in chapters 2 and 3, Read through chapters 2 and 3 and notice how many times Jesus does good stuff and ticks people off. This is the conflict motif. And maybe that's because, again, it's a reflection. It's a special circumstance that the church in Rome was going through. They were in conflict with Nero. They reach out to touch society, and what do they get in return? They get blamed for a fire in Rome that they didn't start. And so there's this huge conflict now that's going on, and that's reflected in some of the words that are brought up. Okay, now the message of the book. Message of the book. We talked a little bit earlier about Jesus now being a, a servant. And I want to talk about servanthood just for a minute. I want to give you two things about servanthood. It'll, and it'll basically finish our time up today. And it's this. Number one, is that in this book we see a paradox. We see a paradox and that is this that servants now are going to be invested with authority. The concept of servant and authority, which in the minds of some people now just doesn't fit together, and yet in this book we're going to see this. And so Jesus now comes, and what you're going to find as you go through, as he served people, he fed the 4,000, He's going to go into situations. He's going to find hurting people. He's going to ask them what they need and so forth. And you see Jesus doing that. But then when people watch him at a distance, it says they watch him and they're amazed at his authority. He speaks to demons. He speaks words with authority. He speaks to the elements and they obey him. It's seemingly he's just going around helping people, but he does it with such great power. Why? Because God can trust him with the power. He's proven himself as a servant so that when the master invests more authority in him, he knows that the servant will not use it for his own selfish end. One of the parables that Jesus tells about the end times is a man who leaves home, leaves behind a servant, gives him the authority to take care of all the members of the household, and in his absence, the, master, or the servant that he leaves behind beats the other servants and uses all the wine and food and everything for himself. Why? Because he misused the authority that was given to him. Instead of serving his master and doing the will of the master, he used it to feed himself. And oftentimes we get the idea, why don't we see more power? The question would be, what would we do with it? The day that God knows that he can fully trust us, maybe we'll get more. Or will we do like James and John, call fire down from heaven and destroy the opposition when Jesus wants to save them? We have to learn not to step out and use the power of God, just like Jesus. Turn this stone into bread. And Jesus says, no, I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I follow his guidance, not just feed my needs. That's what kind of king we need to be in the earth. And so we see the issue of servanthood and authority go hand in hand. So when you hear people preach messages on, we need to be servants, it's true. Because you know what happened in the ancient world? A good servant usually was emancipated by his master. And in the ancient Roman world, because there was no public education, people couldn't get educations. But if a master had a good servant, he would pay for his education. And then after years of service, he would let him go with great substance so that he could live his own life because he was such a good servant that now he knows that he will take care of his life well. We had nothing. God takes us into his family. He trains us. He educates us. And there comes a day when he says, now, go do it. Go do it. Okay. But he does that with faithful servants. Now, when Jesus functioned as a servant, and I want to leave these points with you, how do we characterize Jesus' service? 
How do we characterize his service? If we're called to be servants, we've got to watch Jesus' model and watch how he does it because he's going to show us exactly what a good servant is all about. And I'd like to give to you six terms. Six terms now that describe different ways in which Jesus served, and you see it in his actions. And these are the six terms now that we need to see developed in our own life. The first one is this. Jesus served in humility. He served in humility. He does not need the recognition for himself. What you're going to find in Mark, like in chapter 1, verse 36. Chapter 1, verse 36. It says the people were looking for him. And the, and the disciples come to him and says, everybody's looking for you. Jesus said, then it's time to move. Well, the crowds are waiting for you. I'm not here for the crowds. And he moves on to another little town where there's some more needy people. Most of us would see a big crowd and we say, another meeting. Jesus says, it's time to move on. He's not impressed by the crowds. He's not impressed when people are even looking. He's following the direction of his father. And there's a humility that comes to play there. He does thing, chapter 1, verse 44. Chapter 1, verse 44, he does an amazing act of, uh, of, of healing for a person. And then he says, but don't tell anybody. Don't you want me to? No, I don't want you to tell them. I want to go meet those people individually. I don't want them to follow a sideshow. Don't tell them. But the people did anyway. Okay, they never did that. We see that Jesus would have a crowd one day, and after it in chapter 3, verse 6, it says this, and after the crowd began to dissipate, Jesus would sail off into an isolated place to be by himself. He had to be alone. He didn't have to be in the limelight. In fact, he needed those times to recharge his engine. It's okay to be alone. It's okay to be hidden in the house, hand of God rather than notice me. Jesus was humble. He was powerful enough. And it's the interesting thing <laughs> when you watch the, some of the shows on those who want to be rich and those who want to be famous and everything else. There's a real difference between those who want to be great and those who are. <laughs> Oftentimes with the people that are great and really rich, my dad knew one of these. He's a guy that owned the biggest barge company on the entire Mississippi River. Build the jetties, the levees down there on the Mississippi. That whole Midwestern section of the United States is now safe from flood because of the influence of this one man. He owns a whole fleet of these 75-foot tugboats. He has his own private jet and everything else. And then he walks around in very common clothes. And Dad said, you never know he's rich. Why? He doesn't have to prove anything. It's what he is. Don't have to prove a thing. And if we're children of God, we don't have to brag about it. We don't have to make sure everybody knows. Just be what you are. It's called humility. Let them find out. Number two, in tenderness. You serve in tenderness. Look at the times that Jesus encountered people. He goes into Peter's house. His mother-in-law is sick at this point. And Jesus goes up and he gently touches her hand. Jesus is very personal. He doesn't stand off at a distance and scream at people. In chapter 9 now, we're seeing here, here is a, a demon-possessed son. Jesus now reaches down, and he touches this young child that's being tormented. It tells you also in the Gospel of Mark, and you go over in chapter 10, it says, and parents brought their children to Jesus so that what? He would touch them. His disciples got all a bit bent out of shape, and it says, don't you dare hinder these kids from coming. Can you imagine? You being a little toddler, a three-year-old, your parents take somebody we'd like you to meet. Somebody lays their hands on you and happens to be the creator of the universe. <laughs> and you look into his eyes and see a friend. That would change your life forever. It just would. Because he's tender. He's there. Number three, he serves in the middle of opposition. He serves in the middle of opposition. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, the scribes were standing as they dropped the paralytic man down through there. And now they were looking for a reason to accuse him and so forth. They were thinking it in their thoughts. They said, this man is a blasphemer. He knew what they were thinking. He knew what they were going to do. He healed the man. He didn't look just for safe times. Because he wasn't there for safe times. He was there to touch the needs of people. The opposition rose in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, he's in the temple. There's a man with a withered hand. The only problem is it's the wrong day of the week. It's the Sabbath. 
And so he's standing in there, and this man comes up, and he's got a withered hand, and Jesus says, okay, what do I do? Keep a day or help a person? He helps a person, knowing good and well that the officials are standing all along, and they say, you broke the Sabbath day. You broke the Sabbath day, but I was helping a person. You broke it, and their law was more important than the help for people. But you know what? How many times did Jesus break the Sabbath because people are more important than keeping a day? He did that. People laughed at him. There was a daughter that was dead, and he walked in, and people laughed at him and says, what are you going to do? And he says, uh, we'll see. And the daughter came back to life, and then Jesus was laughing at that point, all right? Okay. Number four, self-sacrificing. Self-sacrificing. In chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, Jesus ministered all day with the crowds. He ministered so intensely all day that he couldn't even eat. He had no time to take a break. He was pressed by the multitude and their desperate needs. And when his own personal family came and watched what he did with taking, taking no break whatsoever, he said, he's out of his mind. No, he's in love. He's in love with people. And when he's in love with people, he's willing to make sacrifices. He's willing to do that. And that's why the crowds loved him, because he just didn't think about himself. Number five, he ministered in compassion. He ministered in compassion. In chapter 1, verse 44, when he looked out, it says, Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the crowds. He saw them as people desperately in need. In Psalms, or rather in Mark chapter 8, verse 2, Mark 8, 2, it says, I have compassion on the multitudes. They're like sheep at this point without a shepherd. Even when the rich young ruler came, <laughs> And he said, what must I do to have eternal life? He told him, and the young man walked away. And Jesus looked at him and says, he loved him. He loved the man that turned his back on him. This is how Jesus cared for people. And the last point I'll give you here is in prayerfulness. In prayerfulness. Jesus prayed a lot. He would come to a, a place where he would minister, and then he'd go back that night and pray a good portion of the night. Why? So he could get up and do it again the next day. He would know exactly why his father wanted him to do. Now, the importance of the book. What's the importance of the book? It's very simple. When Jesus shows us the pattern for a servant, he does it for a reason. So that he can give us the role model to follow. <coughs> and that we can watch him, and then we can go out and begin to do it the same way. This is a book about actions. Jesus goes here, he does this. Loyalty is not in words only. Loyalty is in our actions. Our faithfulness is seen in what we do. And it's interesting that at the end of this book, how does it end? These are the signs of those who believe. They lay their hands on the sick. They prophesy. They cast out demons. What are my people doing? They're acting like servants. They're not just standing around talking about how good they are and how spiritual they are. They're getting out, getting dirty with people. They're touching lives. And these are the signs of those who believe. It's not the statement of faith they write. It's the life they live. That's what marks them. Okay. We'll end there.